It's been a few months since I did a decent video on the Festus disc, but although it has been on the back burner, I've been keeping track of it, which means I've been keeping track of the new papers that are showing up at academia.edu, of which there are an increasing number, of course, as there is everywhere else. But I've also noticed that my videos on the Festus disc have been getting a lot of views. Well, relative to what I usually get, I'm typically talking to myself, and that's very nice. And my Academia profile has also been visited quite frequently. Now, just so you know, I don't maintain that profile. In fact, I've, I've never even visited it. But my growing ability to translate the disc and my ability to prove that what I've translated so far and correct is correct has been extended lately. So it's time for an update. I'm going to start with what I've translated so far. Then I'm going to extend it a bit. It's going to be a critical bit. Not only is it going to fit perfectly with what I've done so far, but the way I did it has opened doors for future translation work. And there's a lot of work to be done on the Festus disc. Then I'm going to walk through three peer-reviewed papers that support my translation in very gratifying, very explicit detail. Now, of course, you know what this means. I'm the first man in the world to ever successfully read a Minoan document. And my successful reading, in turn, allows us to figure out which Minoan city was doing what and when. Obviously, we must all give good credit for a job well done. In this case, I acknowledge my debt to Gareth Allen Owens and John Coleman. They're the ones who figured out how most of these symbols are supposed to be pronounced. Dr. Owen had also made a splendid breakthrough on side B of the Festus disc. More on that later. Let's start with a couple of interesting details before diving into the first four words of Site A. It opens with five dots. That's a notation for 50 on Minoan accounting documents. Could this be one of at least 50 other disks? We also have these marks throughout the document. Most thought they were there because the words were important, and as you see here, they were right. But this is also, this is also the Minoan mark for 100, which of course naturally lends itself to the idea of fullness and completeness, like 10 or 1 or 1,000. Okay, let's start. Equipaia to you, et tuque, al dt, al lp. Now you will notice the eque and que. I think the Minoan spoke Italic, the parent language of Latin, and this is a bracket. The equivalent in classic Latin would be que paia you, que et tu. Et tu is Latin, and you, et tu brute. Both paia you and you, au dt. Well, a DT is the mother of the sun god in the Rig Veda, and this is obviously a sun disc. We're going to confirm that on side B, that this disc is in fact dedicated to the sun god. Al Al P confused me for a while, but one symbol can represent more than one similar sound in the same part of the mouth, the same address, as they say in Sanskrit. So that could be P, but it could also be Phi, which is what you see in Hebrew. With a dot, the Pe is P, without it it's F which would relate this to the Latin al ferro, to bear or snatch away, which perfectly fits because as I've revealed in previous videos, side A is a funeral prayer for a king or a hero whom death has snatched away. In this case, you and aditi. So thanks to a Greek viewer named Demetrios A, I'm pretty sure the opening line is, both panieria and you, aditi, bear away, Paneria being a form of Greek for something like high priestess or all priestess, pan, like pantheism. Trust me for now, this is not as random as it looks. I'll actually be able to confirm everything I've just said referencing other Minoan artifacts. But let's look at a couple of other words on this side that also support my translation. They're both the same word, but the way the second one was written gave me the critical clue as to what this poem is actually about. It gravitates around this animal hide, symbol 27. It's a symbol for the sound value wa, and it's displayed very prominently in words A17 and A29. But in A29, the hides are flipped. The word reads, Ique wa wa terai sui. I think this is a Franken word, patched together from three different words in two different languages. Ique wa wa terai sui. Ique wa wa ter sui. Water is a Hittite word for water, exactly like it sounds. I think ipwa is the Minoan word for water. It becomes the Latin aqua. But why three syllables? Because it comes from the Proto-Indo-European aqua eh. A central syllable, que, just like we see here, surrounded by two glottals. Awful sounds you make at the back of your throat down in the glottis. Proto-Indo-European had at least two of them and maybe up to four. Semitic languages still have glottals. Hittite did too. 
Equal wa, water, sui. Water, water, sui. What is sui? One need only look at a Latin dictionary. Equal wa, water, stitched together. Water, water, stitched together. And where do we have water and water stitched together? At the end of the world, where the waters above are knit together with the waters below. And in the midst of those waters is the world, which abides in a bubble. The sun rides along the skin of that bubble. At the edge of the world, this is the Minoan world, is the Hittites. Their waters are the Black Sea. The Minoans, of course, are the center of the world, as are we all. Here's a side view. The sun travels around the world along the body of the bubble, which you could also call its skin, here represented by animal skins. Now, as you know, most of the time the world is flat, so the world under our feet is upside down, as are the skies. This upside down world is, of course, the land of the dead. And here is our hero or king transitioning into the land of the dead. He's wearing a mohawk, and we have other terracotta figurines of Middle Minoan warriors wearing mohawks as well. The sun moves around him in a spiral, as it moves around us all, as do the words on the disc itself. So the disc isn't just a document, it's kind of a comic book. And the ka, the rosettes you see here, are the symbols for the sun. Everywhere, not just on Crete. This thing that looks like a warrior shield is a kernos, plural kernoi. This is a warrior, so it's fitting that it actually looks like a shield, but it's really a stone board game. Minoans had kernoi all over the island at transition zones. And of course, when you move from the land of the living to the land of the dead, you have to pass through the biggest transition zone ever. I talk about Kernoy in my video, My Understanding of the Festus Disc Deepens, linked below. And so these other Minoan artistic representations now make sense. The double axe is the sun, here moving around the world. One face of the axe is towards the land of the living, the other the land of the dead. This fact was brought to my attention by Nano Marnatos in this book, Minoan Kingship and the Solar Goddess, although the Minoans had a solar god. She's the one who made the breakthrough here. A world-renowned Minoan scholar in her own right, her father was also a world-renowned Minoan scholar. Here's the sun again in the upside-down world under the sea. Notice the upside-down axe on the left. The poem on side A of the Festus disc can be found here on the Agia Triata sarcophagus. It was made about 350 years after the Festus disc. I had a dream decades ago after my grandmother died. I was driving through a forest. The trees came right up to the side of the road, and they were so tightly packed together you couldn't see anything past them. Grandma was in the car with me. In biblical terms, she was an Elohim, a great one. Her eyes were shiny. She still looked like Grandma, yet she seemed eternal, and strangely enough, young. But I always wondered what those trees were. This sarcophagus told me. They were my ancestors. And here's our king, standing behind a tree. There are spirals around him and spirals along the side, just like our disc. When we die, we don't die alone. We're gathered to our people. Here are the sides, pointing right back to our Festus disc. The two women in the sun chariot are hailed in the opening line. Rosettes are prominent, just like on the disc. They're pulled by a griffin. On the right, they're in the land of the dead, the upside down world. Their chariot is pulled by goats. They're over water. You can't see much of him, but there's a man standing over their heads. You can just barely see his leg. C.G. Young was convinced that the land of the dead is just part of the natural world and should be treated that way. And yes, these people are still alive. Equally important to me were the dream experiences I had before my mother's death. News of her death came to me while I was staying in the Tessin. I was deeply shaken for it had come with unexpected suddenness. The night before her death, I had a frightening dream. I was in a dense, gloomy forest. Fantastic, gigantic boulders lay about among huge jungle-like trees. It was a heroic, primeval landscape. Suddenly, I heard a piercing whistle that seemed to resound through the whole universe. My knees shook. Then there were crashings in the underbrush and a gigantic wolfhound with a fearful, gaping maw burst forth. At the sight of it, the blood froze in my veins. It tore past me, and I suddenly knew. The wild huntsman had commanded it to carry away a human soul. I awoke in deadly terror, and the next morning I received the news of my mother's passing. Seldom has a dream so shaken me, for upon superficial consideration, it seemed to say that the devil had fetched her. But to be accurate, the dream said that it was the wild huntsman, the Grünhüttel, or the wearer of the green hat, 
who had hunted with his wolves that night. It was a season of fern storms in January. It was Wotan, the god of my Alemannic forefathers, who had gathered my mother to her ancestors. Negatively to the wild horde, but positively to the Saliglut, the blessed folk. So it was my own Saliglut who had gathered around me. Ah, and that's where the word lot comes from. And thinking about that hunter, the blessed folk are eternally doing what they love. For the Minoans, that means they're still hunting, or maybe riding around in chariots with their best childhood friend. Among the Vikings, they're still fighting battles, and then rising off the battlefield if they were killed and going off to have a beer with their friends. And look, some of these hunters have reunited with their old beloved hounds, just like the Grunhuntel. Like I said, the land of the dead is part of our natural world. There's nothing spooky or mysterious. When you understand that or treat it that way, it makes sense. That's why people so far apart in space and time have such similar experiences. Now, on to side B. Gareth Allen Owens has shown that words B-17 to B-26 are almost certainly a version of what scholars call the Minoan libation formula. They find it all over Crete. The words that are marked are bracketed in red. Once again, you will see they are important. And let's bring in the Roman alphabet so we can read them. Ipewaye al nitino, al nopa, al diti, zo al nitino, wapinadwa, tiriute, tiditi, tinariue, zo al nitino. Al diti, tititi. Since we can be sure we're looking at an early form of Latin, DT is obviously deity, a god, so of course it's marked, and of course al diti could be a diti. But that al nitino and zo al nitino, kind of a stumper. What are those clearly important Minoan words? Well, they're not Minoan, they're Hatti. That's a strange language isolate that nobody can understand, although they know about it, which means it's not related to any known language. Hatti is not to be confused with Hittite, the language of the Hittites. But the Hittites did use it in rituals, just like the Roman Catholic Church used Latin for centuries and still updates the Latin language. And just like the Semites in Mesopotamia would use Sumerian, another language isolate. So we're back to the Hittites. And I've found this Hittite ritual play that's obviously connected with side B of the Festus disc. Zahanetana is said twice, just like Zoanitino. So on both sides, we have important words said twice. And I think I've demonstrated beyond dispute that they both point right back to the Hittites. A Zahanetana or Zoanitino is apparently some kind of holy place dedicated to the sun god, which brings us right back to our spiraling sun disc. So the Minoans and Festos are erecting an ideology on top of a traditional burial ritual, which would still be used for several centuries, whose aim is to knit together the people on the island with the people on the mainland. Remember that, that's going to pop up. This is the middle Minoan, the end of the 17th century BC, and the Hittites are just coming into their own. In 400 years, they will have a vast empire that, they will, be, that will be ruled by a great king. Remember that too, because that's also coming back. One last thing. The Bronze Age Collapse, which I am convinced was spearheaded by Minoan exiles who had regrouped in Italy. The Egyptians called them the Sea People. There were Italian settlers right here, as a matter of fact, and we know that because they used pottery that's also been found in southern Italy, yet it was made locally. They didn't stay long. After the Sea People invaded and destroyed the local capital and probably killed the local king, they were gone. The prize was Cyprus, called Alashia at the time. Again, keep that in mind. And when we look at our papers, this territory here is going to become important, mostly the area of the Arzawa Confederation, but also including Walusha at the top, that's the city of Troy, which at the time of the Festus disc was part of the Ashua Confederation, but not afterwards, very important. That's also going to show up later, and it's going to be more evidence that I am, in fact, correctly translating the Festus disc. Now the prize, as I said, was Alashia, and the reason why I know these are Minoans is because when they were the classic Minoans, they erected horns of consecration all over Crete. And after the invasion and the collapse, they erected horns of consecration all over the prize, Cyprus. But here's the deal, and here's where my work on the Festus disc helps flip the script on Greek history. We've been told that there are Greeks and there are Cretans. There are Mycenaeans and there are Minoans, and that the Mycenaeans either conquered the Minoans or helped the king of Knossos conquer his fellow Minoans, and then they became culturally Mycenaean after that. But that scenario is not right. It's wrong. 
as I've just discovered, and as I will demonstrate to you, they're all Minoans, or as they once called themselves, the Captor. But the Minoans at Knossos call, started calling themselves the Achaeans, and they're the ones who fought the Trojan War. Now, the Trojan War didn't happen in 1200 or 1300 BC, like most people thought, including myself. Those dates are impossible, as we will see. They fought that war in 1400 BC, and it actually did happen. The archaeology in Greece and the archaeology in Turkey fit that like a glove, as does my work on the Festus disc. And here's the kicker. When the Minoans at Knossos started calling themselves the Achaeans, they were calling themselves the Sea People, which famously is what the Egyptians called them at the, on the, at the famous Karnak Temple inscription from the Bronze Age collapse. So they're all Minoans, and they're all the Sea People. And once upon a time, they all called themselves the Captor. And while quite a few of them stayed on Crete, and we see them centuries later, even during the Classic Era, they called themselves the Ateo Cretans, the true Cretans, many of them migrated, mostly to Italy, I'm sure, where a few of them traveled up the Tiber River, settled at a hill that they labeled Captor, Captor Hill, which, which we call Capitol Hill. Now, Capitol and Captor phonologically are basically the same word. So, what brought on the Bronze Age collapse? Well, as you will see, the Achaean kingdom, or really it's an empire, was inherently unstable. And the captor took advantage of that because meanwhile, they'd been lurking around in the Eastern Mediterranean, making friends, including many in the Achaean empire, and they were keeping up with internal events, events of current affairs. And when their opportunity came, they took it. And they settled accounts with their Achaean rivals and the Hittites. And they destroyed the city of Troy, and they occupied Cyprus. And I will demonstrate that using these papers. So let's get to work on them. The first one, Minoan-Anatolian relations and the Ahiyawa question, a reassessment of the evidence. I added those two symbols under the H's because they belong there. It's what you might have seen earlier on the map. It shows you they're pronounced K as in Bach. George Akopoulos thinks the Hittites are using a name they made up themselves, and that at the earlier stage they're talking about Minoans, while at a later stage they're talking about Mycenaean Greeks. Obviously, my position is they called themselves the Achaeans, and they were all Minoans. In fact, as you'll see in the next chapter, the earlier stage was nothing less than the Trojan War itself. A group of middle Minoan ceilings from Festos display remarkable stylistic affinities to ceilings from Karahoyuk in central Anatolia. This connection implies not only stylistic and cultural interactions, but also the possible adoption of administrative and political systems. Correct. I just hit a home run, boys. My first quote. Good job. This is exactly what my reading of the Festus disc was telling us. Why did the Minoans choose these specific sites, if it is accepted that Minoan trades can be interpreted as evidence of an active Minoan presence? Well, Miletos, for example, seems to have been the final destination of a significant commercial route related to the metals coming from the Anatolian interior. The acquisition of Anatolian metals is proposed as a significant factor in Minoan activity there by Nehemiah. Moreover, if it is accepted that they had political control of these sites, they could have defended themselves more easily against a possible attack. A couple of footnotes. The location of sites such as Miletos on trade routes made them attractive, as of me. It must be borne in mind that Miletos was probably an island in this period, like Tavshan Adashi and Iasos, while Abakuk Daichusa was on the edge of a small peninsula. This means that they had obvious advantages as far as their defense is concerned. Okay, so we're there just enough to take reasonable advantage of the situation, but we're not building an empire. We needed metal. The Minoans were the bronze people. According to the Hittite state archives at Hattusha, the first reference to the Ahiyawa comes from the Maduwada indictment, which is dated to the reign of King Arniwanda I, and we have dates, and describe events that took place during the reign of his father, Tutalia I or the second. They say that because there might have been a Tutalia in the earlier kingdom, but nobody knows for sure. According to the text of the indictment, the king of Hatti complains to Maduwada, a ruler of western Anatolia under Hittite overlordship, about the crimes of the latter during the reign of the previous Hittite king, Tutalia. In particular, when Atarashia, the man from Ahia, an older version of Ahiyawa, attacked Maduwada, the Hittites supported their vassal ruler. But the latter later became an ally of Arzawa, the most important enemy of the Hittites in the region. Moreover, he created a new alliance with his former enemy, Atarashia, 
and together they made a foray into Cyprus. So there's Cyprus. And here's a here's a footnote dealing with something that's later in the paper, but having to do with coalitions in this part of the world and the Hittites. It is significant to mention that the word Ashua was known to the Minoans as it appears in a late Minoan 1b tablet of Linear A from Aya Triada as Ashuya. Correct. Another home run. Agia Triada is a suburb of Festos. They, of course, are talking about Troy. Linear B is Mycenaean Greek. Linear A is the same writing system except used for the Minoan language, which we have already been reading, which I think is italic. Okay, this is where we get to the etymology of the word Achaean, where it comes from. The etymology of the word Achiawa must first be considered. The Indo-European root Ach, like Achaean, is connected with water. Many names of rivers and lakes, such as Enakos, Achelous, Lake Acherusia, and others have this root. Even in the Hittite language, the word aqua, anzi, means they drink, while the Luwian word aku means to drink. This association with water endures, endures into Latin, aqua, and even into modern indo purian languages, aqua in Italian, agua in Spanish. Given the widespread usage of the ak root to indicate water, it is worth considering whether, and if so, how the word ahiyawa might relate to some physical characteristic of the land. Although densely populated with islands and people, the Aegean region is dominated by water. In other words, the Aegean Sea itself. And it seems reasonable to suggest that the Luwian Hittite name for the people of the Aegean was something like Sea People, as in Ak. At this point, it must be noted that the name Pelaskoi, Pelaskians, was commonly used by the ancient Greeks in order to describe the older inhabitants of Greece. What it, is, what it is above all important to mention is that the name is strongly associated with water, as it probably derives from the word Pelagos, Pelagos which means sea, like Agiao Pelagos, the Aegean Sea in Greek. Okay. And here is where it first shows up. Moreover, it may be remarked that the place name Akaiwia, very similar to the Hittite Achiawa in the Homeric Akaioi, appears on a tablet of Linear B from Knossos. This is the only evidence, but no similar reference can be found anywhere else in the Linear B archives. Crete is the only place in the Aegean world where a word connected to Ahiyawa appears. Let's see more about what this means. To sum up, it has been suggested here that after Tutalia's campaigns in the Arzawa lands, the Hittites came into contact with the Aegean populations, possibly Cretans, who were already settled in Anatolia, or had at least heavily influenced the behavior of some of the local population. These Aegeans, when they became involved in the conflict between the Hittites and the native Anatolian people, supported the latter, as both the archival material and the archaeological finds testify. In the author's opinion, an intervention by Crete under the lead of Knossos cannot be ruled out. It must be added that during the above period, late Minoan II, Knossos was undoubtedly the most powerful polity in the southern Aegean, which means the Mycenaean mainlanders could not have conquered Knossos. She also has a navy. So it can be reasonably assumed that it was in a position to over undertake overseas activities across the Aegean. Rudder has recently argued that the name Ahiawa or Ahia was originally applied by the Hittites to late Minoan II to 3A2 early kingdom centered in Knossos. However, although Rudder tends to accept the Cretan theory for the appearance of Ahiawa, he considers that this happened when a Mycenaean administration came to power at Knossos. We have a footnote. This is from Rudder. Gorilla has also argued that the identification of Ahiyawa with the Mycenaean Knossos of late Minoan II, 3A2 early, while Müller Selka identifies the kingdom of Ahiyawa with Mycenaean Crete after examining funerary practices in Crete and Western Anatolia. Well, there you go. Splendid. Now we have the funerary practices thrown in there. Then we sum up our paper. Bearing the above in mind, the situation could be summarized as follows. When the Hittites first came into contact with the Ahiyawa, they, were possibly interact they possibly interacted with the agents of Minoan culture, which dominated in the Aegean. However, after a long and turbulent period in both the Aegean and Central Anatolia, these links were interrupted. When the Hittites restored their power in the area in the late 14th century, that's right before 1300, and again started interacting with Western Anatolia and the Aegean, the Mycenaeans had already established their domination over the islands and perhaps also controlled some points on the Anatolian coast. From this point on, all Hittite references to Ahiyawa refer to the Mycenaeans. 
The Egyptian sources, which we don't talk about here, but he does, although they differ from those of the Hittites, could be interrupted, interpreted the same way. Only the mention of the name Keftiu in the 15th century indicates interactions with the Minoans, that's the captor. While the reference to both Keftiu and the Tanaha, the Danans, which is what the Achaeans are also called, during the first half of the 14th century, could be seen as evidence of the turbulent situation in the Aegean and the struggle between the Minoans and the Mycenaeans for dominance. So there's been good evidence for quite a while that Crete was behind more all of this, and more is coming. The next article is by Konstantinos Giannakos, Cutting Edge Technology and Know-How of Minoans slash Mycenaeans During Late Bronze Age and Possible Implications for the Dating of the Trojan War. This is going to be very fun because he dates the Trojan War, finally. Giannakos presents us with three options for that war. The first two I knew about, but they had a lot of problems. The third option I never even thought of, because Troy wasn't destroyed in that event, and the Iliad said it was. But Giannakos is going to show us that Homer wasn't the only one who talked about the Trojan War back in the day. Troy 6H, destroyed about 1300 by an earthquake, or maybe 1318 BC by a meteorite strike? What? Although some still think the walls were destroyed by invaders. The invasion theory seems to make this event promising, but as Giannakos demonstrates, there's no way that invasion was the Trojan War. You'll see. Troy 7a, the next layer up, originally dated to 1260 to 1270 BC, which is actually perfect. That date implies the 10-year siege of Troy broke the Mycenaean kingdoms and led to their collapse. Except for that thing Giannakos brings up. Again, you'll see. But there's an even bigger problem. The destruction has now been redated to 1190 to 1180 BC. That's a Bronze Age collapse. The Achaean Empire was dead and gone by this time. The Hittites were next on the chopping block. Now the new date. One layer depicting a vigorous house cleaning dated to the transition between Troy 6 F to G around 1400 BC. Hmm. It had rich Minoan and Mycenaean shirts. Okay. Tell me more. If it were not the name of Troy and the Iliad, Hisarlik would doubtless have been pronounced a Mycenaean trading colony. Hisarlik is the name of the site today. Very interesting. Okay, that's actually quite stunning. That tells us the Greeks had actually conquered and successfully occupied Troy in 1400 BC. As for the other two dates, there's a major event that knocks them both completely out of contention. The Battle of Kaddish. I never even thought to factor that into this. It was the closest the Bronze Age would ever get to a world war. It completely exterminates the other two events as plausible options for the Trojan War. Let's read about it. The Battle of Kaddish between Muwatali II and Pharaoh Ramses II took place during the fifth regnal year of Ramses II, dated to 1299, and was a showdown between the armies of the two kings. Muwatali had been preparing his kingdom for this battle. First of all, he put in order affairs on the west coast of Anatolia, signing the treaty with Alexandu of Wilusha. Furthermore, he shifted the royal seat of the kingdom from Hattusha to Tarhuntasha, closer to the frontier with Egypt, near Kaddish. So, by definition, Troy had to have survived the Trojan War, because the Trojan government is signing a peace treaty with the Hittite Empire in 1300 BC. It would be another hundred years before the city would actually be destroyed. After the signing of the Alexandu Treaty, he had the opportunity to bring, and brought with him, as allies in the Battle of Kaddish, people from almost all the lands of Asia Minor with their chiefs. All of these powers and principalities are listed as allies of Troy during the Trojan War, that's impossible in 1300 BC. Now, at the top of the list is Dardany. Dardany has a very famous king. Aeneas, Onax according to Homer, was a Dardanian king and chief in the Trojan War and ally of Trojans, called son of Dardanos by mouth of god Osidon, Poseidon. Aha, now we're getting to the bottom of things. This is Aeneas from the Aeneid, the famous Roman epic poem and the alleged ancestor of the Romans. But that mythology assumes Troy was destroyed. It was not. Here's what almost certainly happened. Ancient Aeolian literature keeps a conspicuous memory of that event. Troy was not entirely destroyed and was not left uninhabited. The city was not completely abandoned after its capture by the Achaeans, and there was even a surviving population that stayed in Olelion and a dynasty that ruled over it. Traces of that dynasty can be found in the narrative of Hellenicus of Lesbos' Troika, as reported by Dionysius of Halicarnassus and Strabo. 
although Strabo reiterates the Homeric version of complete destruction. After Aeneas escapes the capture of Troy by retreating to the highlands of Mount Ida, he negotiated with the victorious Achaeans his relocation to the city of Aenea in the Thermaic Gulf. Eventually, Ascanius, Aeneas' son, returned to the Old Ilion, where he joined forces with Scamandrius, Hector's son, in refounding it as the New Ilion. Ascanius and Scamandrius now ruled New Ilion, till migration of Aeolians who expelled the descendants of Ascanius. And the archaeology agrees. The image is closer to the situation of the vigorous housekeeping in Troy 6 FG and the working of the hypothesis of a Trojan War in about 1400 BC. Furthermore, according to the Alexandre Treaty, and this is very interesting, Wulusha defected from Hati during or before Tudalia II's reign. Wulusha's defect obligated Tudalia II to intervene militarily in the region. Uh oh. This reminds us of the Iliad. The god Poseidon prophesies a kind of change in diplomatic external affairs of Troy by the change of the royal dynasty, compatible most probably with a defect of Troy from Hatti. Since the three main linguistic and racial groups of the kingdom of Hatti are referred to as allies in the, of the overthrown dynasty of Priam. After a possible dynastic change in Troy, the new pro-Greek kings kept good relations with the Hatti, sending messengers, and thus Tutalia II did not enter Wilusha. It could be inferred that about 125 years later, the Dardanians still remained rulers of Troy and, with all their allies, followed Muyotali II into the Battle of Kadesh. Now, the archaeology does, doesn't just agree in Troy, it agrees on Crete, too. This image is also compatible with the participation of Idomeneus, Anax of Knossos during the Trojan War. After 1375 BC, Knossos was no more an administrative and political center of Crete. Okay, it's all coming together very nicely, but let's step aside just a second and have a quick look at this paper. The History of the Arzawan State During the Hittite Period by Metin Alp Arslan. Mr. Arslan has maps, and as you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is from the 16th century BC, so about 100 years to 200 years before our new putative date of the Trojan War, but the Hittite presence here would be about the same. This is what the picture looked like in 1300 BC, when I thought the Trojan War might have happened. There is no way the army of the Achaean Empire would park at the gates of Troy for 10 years without the great king of the Hatti doing something about it. Now back to our paper for a little mopping up. In late Hellenic 3A1, Mycenaean pottery jumps from 9 to 40 percent of the total pottery specimens in Troy. That's our 1400 BC date. Then it drops to 20 percent in late Hellenic 3A2. The late Hellenic 3A2 to B is the Battle of Kadesh and the peace treaty with the Hittites. Then Mycenaean pottery drops like a rock to 7% of total specimens, by far the lowest on this list. The hypothesis of a Trojan War around 1400 BC or one or two generations before, after which Aeneas, a new pro-Greek king, replaced Priam's royal family in Troy, coincides with the apogee of a larger period of prosperity in Mycenaean palatial centers with high-level construction of massive, large-scale intuitive engineering projects depicting the conspicuous consumption and the development of original know-how and cutting-edge technology. This period is more compatible with military expansion, during which Akagamuna, perhaps the king of Ahiyawa, owned the islands around Troy. The brother of the king of Ahiyawa, a lesser ruler, not the king, Annex, was capable to perform raids deep in Asia Minor and against Cyprus and Denin performed also naval raids against the Egyptian seashores, obliging Pharaoh to patrol and fortify the Nile mouths. Okay, there's Cyprus again, 200 years before the Bronze Age collapse. Akagamuna is King Agamemnon, and since Geonakos has securely dated the Trojan War to 1400 BC, there can now be no doubt. The brother discussed here is almost certainly Menelaus, called the King of Sparta in the Iliad, but this paper is right, he isn't the Annex, or Wanax actually. The Greeks lost the W sound, but still had it in the Bronze Age. If you see a funny looking F in Greek, that's the W sound. When you see Menelaus described as a king of Sparta in the Iliad, he's, it's actually telling us he's the Lawagetus of Sparta, a sub-king, if you will. The title Wanax was reserved for the king of kings, that's Agamemnon. The next paper will fill you in on all of this. By the way, Helen of Troy was Menelaus' wife. Her running off with Paris is what started the war in the first place. 
Here's an interesting story. I heard of this years ago, but I thought it was just one of those stories you hear, but it turns out it was probably true. Grotebuch makes mention of a note by the Byzantine author Stephanus Byzantius saying that in Samalia, city of Caria, founded by Motilos, Motilos hosted Paris and Helen, and suggested Motilos was an echo of Muatali II. There were two kings with the name Muatali, Muatali II, who signed the Ale Alexandri Treaty, so, no. 1285 BC. No. And Muatali I, the predecessor of Tutalia II, probably murdered by Himulu and Kantuzili, who, who placed Tutalia II on the throne. It's this guy. The Hittite tablet, tablet mentions Muatali I and Himuli. Himuili. The name Muatali I in the tablet, written in Akkadian, which is a Semitic language, over in Babylon is Mutali, very close to Motilos, and something like this with Mutali and Humalini. But let's lay some background first on how I operate. I have two rules of thumb that are pertinent here. First, I use the best sources that I can. And secondly, I refuse to accept the impossible. And in this case, the case of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, I refuse to accept the crazy idea that the relatively primitive Greeks had defeated the Minoan navy, landed vast armies on the island of Crete, and conquered cities and kingdoms that dwarfed anything that they had. Knossos was as big as any city in Mesopotamia and in Egypt. Festos is a lot larger, but bigger than anything that they had. So if anybody was going to conquer anyone in 1450 BC, the Minoans would have conquered the Mycenaeans. But I also knew that if the Minoans had conquered mainland Greece, or large parts of it, it would have been very hard for them to hang on to it. Crete was a long ways away. Now think about it. During the time of the Spartans and the Athenians and Alexander the Great, do you ever hear about Crete? During the Roman Empire, Crete was not part of the province of Greece. It was part of the province of Crete and Cyrenaica. Now, that's a part of Libya and North Africa. That's that big hump. Now, we hear about Cyrenaica in my video on, uh, on, on Virgo. Now, even worse, the archaeological evidence indicates that the island of Crete under the Minoan rule, which lasted for centuries, was rarely ever unified. In in fact, you can't even make the case that it ever was. So if they couldn't get it done there, how could they get it done everywhere? But distance is not just a problem here. Greece itself is full of mountains, therefore natural geographic enclaves, therefore difficult to control, just exactly like Crete. So I came to the conclusion, and by the way, this is exactly what you see in the history of classic Greece. So I came to the conclusion that Knossos had conquered the rest of the island of Crete with the help of Mycenaean soldiers. And over the next 200 years, the Greeks on the mainland quite naturally caught up with and surpassed the Cretans and folded them into larger Mycenaean civilization. Well, now I know the Cretans did in fact conquer the mainland Greeks, or at least a lot of them. And this paper is going to tell us exactly how they administered their newly won kingdom, perhaps even an empire. 200 years later, it was dead and gone and forgotten by history. That's not a long time. But I have to give credit where credit's due. This was a very hard job. This is a Frankenstein's monster of a government that they patched together. And nevertheless, they kept it going a lot longer than I thought they would have. Okay, final paper, Jorat Kelder. Ahiyawa in the World of the Great Kings, a reevaluation of the Mycenaean political structures. It is clear that Ahiyawa must have been a land of major importance during the period of 1400 to 1220 BC, the period covered by the Hittite texts. The texts refer to several Ahiyawan incursions in western Anatolia, an area that was claimed by the Hittite crown, as you know, as well as the exchange of messengers between Hittite and Ahiyawan courts. In one of these texts, the so-called Tawagalawa letter, probably dating to the reign of Hattusili III, the ruler of Ahiyawa is designated as a brother of the king of Hatti and as a great king a title that was only bestowed upon the most powerful rulers of the ancient world, such as the kings of Egypt, Assyria, and Hatti itself. A slightly later text also lists Ahiyawa as a great kingdom, but that entry was subsequently erased. So although most scholars today don't believe the Greeks were unified under a single government, the Hittites treated them as if they were, and they would know. In sum, the available evidence allows for reconstruction of the Mycenaean world along very much the Near Eastern lines. There is no evidence to suggest that the Hittite perception of the Mycenaean world was incorrect, that a single great king could not have ruled several, if perhaps all, palatial realms. It has been demonstrated that the archaeological evidence does not at all argue against such a model, he does that earlier, 
If anything, the archaeology seems to support the notion of some degree of overarching control. And that's the key, some degree. At the same time, it has been demonstrated that the evidence from Linear B text is of limited value in reconstructing the political structures of Mycenaean palatial society. There is nothing in the text that argues against political unity. Quite the contrary, in fact, as several features of the Linear B administration at palatial centers, such as Pilos, Knossos, and Thebes, such as the remarkable uniformity of the shape and size of the Linear B tablets, are best explained in and by the context of political unity. Another part of this paper points out that the Greeks had an excellent road system. It also points out how desperately needed those excellent roads were, since Greece was so full of mountains. Road building would certainly be at the top of my list if I were running that country. And here's exactly how they got their business of government accomplished. The presence of two officials, the Wanax and the, the Lawagetas at the top of Mycenaean society, both of which have essentially the same military, economic, and cultic functions, is difficult to reconcile with the model of various smaller and independent palatial states. So the Wanax and Lawagetas, that's Agamemnon and Menelaus, the numerous, and as far as I can see, unconvincing attempts to make a clear distinction between the two officials, other than the size of their respective timony at Pelos, the Wanaxes is thrice the size of that of the Lawagetas, clearly illustrate that there is no real consensus on the exact position and status of either of them. The presence of two throne rooms, usually thought to have been the official residence of the Wanax and Lawagetas in the palaces at Mycenae, Pelos, and Tiryns, but not Knossos, hmm? adds to the uneasy sense of duplicity. If we are indeed dealing with various smaller states, then all of these states apparently had two ruler-like figures at the head of society, residing in almost identical structures that were built virtually next to each other. I find this scenario extremely unlikely, and I know of no anthropological or archaeological parallel. Oh boy, a local king and a king of kings, because that appears to be the arrangement they made. It's hard enough dealing with a single royal succession in a unified kingdom. This arrangement is just begging for trouble. Now, one final thing from this paper before moving on. It's a small quote, but the instant I read it, I was like, okay, this argument is over. The Minoans had conquered the Greeks. It's not 100% proven, but it's where you need to go. Because, of course, Occam's razor. If you hear the sound of hooves, don't go looking for zebras. Let me set you up. The great king of the Greeks during the Trojan War was Agamemnon from the house Atreides, named after his father Atreus. Where did Atreus come from? Liddell Scott Greek English lexicon cross references the word Atreus to the word Atreus with accusative Atreia instead of Atreia. In linear B tablets, two words for a region have been read Ateria and Atero Ateroia. Rege supports that both were derived from a pre Hellenic stem, that's pre Greek, including the word Atreus. The region of Atreus. He translate, transliterates the word ateria as atrie and the word ateria as atrewia. There's that funny looking F, which means, which is a W sound. Now, where was this tablet they're talking about? Somewhere around a city called Pylos, one of the first great mainland Greek cities. But look who else have we found at Pylos? The Griffin Warrior. Buried at the exact same time Knossos started conquering the rest of Crete, in about 50 years before the Trojan War. In May 2015, the first day of renewed excavations at the palace, the team unexpectedly discovered a large stone tomb. Hundreds of artifacts were found, along with the body of a single male, the Griffin Warrior. We have a quote from S. Stocker J. and J. Davis. The team did not discover the grave of the legendary King Nestor, who headed a contingent in the Greek forces at Troy, nor did it find the grave of his father Neleus. They found something perhaps of even greater importance, the tomb of one of the most powerful men who laid the foundation for the Mycenaean civilization, the earliest in Europe. The young man probably knew Nestor personally. He certainly knew his father, Neleus. And here's his face, reconstructed from his skull. This is an agate stone, probably carved to celebrate one of his personal victories. A dead soldier at his feet, another going down, this young man was a regular Achilles, and he is a Minoan. You could say he's a Greek warrior with heavy Minoan influence, but why bother looking for zebras? The cod piece, the long hair, he's the image of the Minoan sun god. This indicates to me he's a king, or at least a prince. The artist carved this agate stone under a magnifying glass, by the way. They must have had them. We just haven't found any. 
Centuries later, Aristotle would discuss features of crabs that he could have only seen under a microscope. A leaping bull, of course, where you have Minoans, you have bull leaping. This also indicates to me he's royalty. This ring alludes to the throne room at Knossos. You can still visit it today. Twin palm trees on a mountaintop. Some kind of screen or door. Here's the throne room. He's called the Griffin Warrior. You can see the griffins. It's been established that the back of the throne emulates a mountaintop. There might have been a screen in the room. Obviously, we're not likely to find any furniture. So where are the palm trees? They were there. You can see them in the original excavation photos. They just weren't included in the reconstruction for some reason. This is where the king sat, the very image of the sun god, like we see with our young warrior. See those back-to-back -back C's on either side of the throne on the bottom? Those are split rosettes. Think of it as a platform, which in turn represents twin mountain peaks. Those are the twin peaks from which the sun rises on one end of the earth and into which it sets on the other. Dr. Marinados demonstrates that convincingly in her later book. And by the way, Agamemnon's uncle Catrius was the king of Crete, and his father was King Minos, after whom the Minoans are named. So Agamemnon's grandfather was King Minos. So amidst all the vicious dynastic struggles and infighting on the mainland, as the Iliad attests to in the rest of Greek literature, uncle Catrius was the only monarch who ruled over a significant unified territory, surely supporting my position that it is the Cretans who had conquered the Greeks. Now. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a shout out to a couple of papers that I started reading after I'd pulled everything together. Collateral Damage, the Santorini Eruption, and the Collapse of Minoan Civilization. The catastrophe of the Santorini volcanic eruption seems to have broken the back of the original Minoan ideology. We have the idea stuck in our heads that Mycenaean warriors swooped in and conquered an otherwise robust Cretan civilization. Not robust enough to stand up to their manly vigor, obviously. But the reality seems to be nobody cared about the old gods by the time the alleged invaders started burning the palaces to the ground. Whoever those old gods were, I think they were the sun god and mother earth. Whereas after a couple of massive earthquakes that had come before individual buildings and indeed entire down, towns were rebuilt with great vigor, after the eruption, a black swan event if there ever was one, a term used in this paper, the so-called palaces were ignored the mountain peak sanctuaries were abandoned after centuries of use. The pottery suddenly changed style. And most importantly, a male god suddenly starts to dominate their iconography. Obviously, we're looking at the rise of Zeus to prominence. I've talked a lot about the rise of thunder gods in general in my most recent videos. Here's another one. From Lugal Gaul to Wanax. Kingship and political organization in the late Bronze Age Aegean. The paper in the center was most interesting to me. No kings, no inscriptions, no historical events. Some thoughts on the iconography of rulership in Mycenaean Greece. The epilogue at the end touches on the results of that paper. Kings and great kings in the Aegean and beyond. The contribution of Blake Homer shows that the iconography in the Bronze Age Aegean differed from that of rulers in Mesopotamia and Egypt. Power was symbolized in a very general, abstract, and anonymous manner making use of a limited spectrum of cultural rhetorics. As a rule, the ruler is not depicted as an individual. This non-personal, collective image of power can be traced back to Minoan Crete, and Blakomer argues no adjustments were made to conform to the Mycenaean Wanax ideology. The apparently missing ruler in Mycenaean Crete may, Blakomer argues, thus partly be explained by the lack of models in Minoan imagery, which is exactly why people had trouble believing the Minoans had kings. They weren't there in their art. In addition, the Wanax kingship probably contained a strong theocratic component, which could be a further reason for the iconographic indistinctiveness. The representation of the Wanax might not have been allowed or deemed unnecessary. Unnecessary because the Wanax might have been the undisputed representative of the gods on earth. To see imagery of the one meant you saw the imagery of the other. Everybody knew that. I talked about that with the Minoan warrior on Pylos. He looked like the sun god precisely because he was royalty, and therefore incarnated him on earth. This paper is interesting because it means the Mycenaean kings are acting just like Minoan kings, I would say because they are Minoan kings. On religion, there's a push me, pull me going on. The failure of the old gods pushed them away. The need for the great Mycenaean king to fit in with his peers everywhere else drew them to the new gods. 
that provoked a reorganization of societal norms so extreme that it looked like they'd been conquered and occupied by invaders. Now there's one final major point regarding the geography of Crete. With Santorini, Crete was an invincible warship in the eastern Mediterranean. Without it, it was largely cut off from the mainland and would lapse very quickly into backwater status. I don't think it played a role in any of the major events of classic Greece, as I talked about before. In fact, I think that change in geography provoked the invasion of mainland Greece because they saw that this was going to be a problem. Therefore, they had to have direct control of resources and populations. Now, I promise to keep this short because I want to keep my video short, but I am going to bring, real quickly, one last paper. But I've talked about this in previous videos, and obviously you need to see it here because, once again, a picture is worth a thousand words. The Theron eruption and Minoan palatial collapse. New interpretations gained from modeling the maritime network. So this is a networking analysis on a computer. And here's the Minoan civilization at its peak. Thera is, I am convinced, Atlantis. From the island of Kythera in southern Greece, the Minoans sent colonists to Italy. We know that because the first pottery of those colonists was made there. Then they lose Thera. A smaller and smaller number of cities grow at the expense of surrounding regions, which is exactly what we see in the archaeology. And then, finally, Crete turns into a backwater. Now, this is a worst-case scenario, but life is a game of inches. And sometimes, when you're forced to give up an inch, you end up losing a whole mile. Well, that's my take on some new papers. Well, new to me. And ideas that I'm going to be pursuing in my future efforts to translate the Festus Disc, which so far has proven to be very helpful in uncovering Minoan and Greek history. And I hope you found this video helpful and maybe entertaining. God bless.